tungkol sa bawat isa Meron pong official debate na mapapanood din nyo sa pagitan ng Iglesia ni Kristo at ng Reform Baptist na ito po ay din ang aming samahan. Nangunguna po ang aming kinikilala ng scholar na si Dr. James White laban po sa pangunahing dibalista ng Iglesia ni Kristo si Ministro Jose Ventilacion. bahati sa panig ng Baptist. Ang layunin ay upang ipaunawa kung bakit matibay ang aming paninindigan sa pagkatiyos ni Kristo. Halin na kayo at panoorin ito. Maraming pong salamat. Copyright Disclaimer under Sections 107 of the Copyright Act 1976 Copyright Disclaimer under Sections 107 of the Copyright Act 1976 Allowance is made for fair use for purposes such as criticism, comment, news reporting, teaching, scholarship, and research. Fair use is a use permitted by copyright statute that might otherwise be infringing. Non-profit, educational, or personal use tips the balance in favor of fair use. what was going to happen. What you just heard, assume Unitarianism, demonstrate that Jesus is not the Father, and argue that there's only one true God. All things that are absolutely irrelevant if you're actually going to present a meaningful argument against the doctrine of the Trinity. Now, as long as all you want to do is get your people all excited by hearing the same things over and over again, well, rah, rah, go to it. But there has not been a single meaningful argument placed against the doctrine of the Trinity so far. It's amazing to me. I predicted it. You say, well, you started with John 17, 3. Yes, to say that if you start with this, you don't understand the doctrine of the Trinity. You are assuming Unitarianism rather than proving Unitarianism. And so, well, we have Jesus differentiated from the Father. We believe that. Uh, Jesus doesn't have the same role as the Father. We believe that. Uh, there's only one true God. We believe that. So far, we haven't yet engaged the debate, and I'm sorry that that's the case. What has happened is we've had some very interesting, inconsistent handling of the text of Scripture. I would like to see if they could put on the screen for me Hebrews chapter 1. Look at what, I'd like to point something out here, and, and, find, and hold each of us consistent this evening. If I do this with the text of Scripture, then, then call me out on it. But notice what it says. But of the Son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. Notice that? Who's, who, who is that? The Son. There, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The right, righteous scepter is the scepter of his kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness above your companions. I can believe all of that. If you deny the deity of Christ, you can only believe half of it. Then verse 10 says, Kai, and, and then the next citation begins. Every major translation, every Unitarian that I've ever debated, including Anthony Buzzard, have all recognized that verses 10 through 12 are about the Son. There is no question about it. And if you try to say, oh no, this, isn't, this, is, this is about somebody else, this isn't about the Son, you're disrupting the entire flow of the text, and nothing from the text was provided as to why that and right here, that word right there, Kai, why that all of a sudden has to change meaning all of a sudden and what comes afterwards. And then, as I pointed out, who is it about in verse 13? About the sun again. So when you read it the appropriate way, it's the sun. 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. We have to change it because we don't believe what the Bible actually teaches about Jesus in verses 10, 11, and 12. That's what was presented to you. Don't mishandle the scriptures in that fashion. Since I've got it up here, I'm going to go ahead and use it and bring, uh, bring about John chapter 17, verse 5, if I can, John 17, 5. And I want you to point something out. And now glorify me together with yourself, Father, with the glory which I had in your presence. You can't tell me what glory that is? You can't tell who's speaking here? This is the Son. This is the one called the Os in John 1.1. 1, 1. And in the two earliest manuscripts and Codex Sinaiticus and Alexand uh, Codex Vaticanus called God in John 1.18... 
who's identified as God by Thomas in John 20, 28. Same book, same author. Here is the Son as a divine person, speaking of a time before the world was, when he was in the presence of the Father and was glorious. That's what John chapter 17, verse 5 is all about. Yes, the Son existed. That's why Philippians chapter 2 says, He made himself of no reputation. That's something the Son did. The Son existed as a divine person prior to his birth in Bethlehem. John chapter 12, we were told. Well, we don't know whose glory this is. Well, let's see if we can figure it out. Let's see if, let's see if the text is as ambiguous as we've been told. These things Isaiah said because he saw his glory and he spoke concerning him. The same him in both. There is not a shred of foundation in the original Greek language. I challenge Mr. Ventilacion, show us anything in the Greek language that differentiates between this Altu right here and this Altu right there. It is an absolute twisting of Scripture to say they're different. Absolute twisting of Scripture. And when it says these things he said because he saw his glory, Mr. Ventilacion said he read my book. Then he should be aware of the fact that in the Greek Septuagint, in the Greek translation of Isaiah chapter 6, there's a textual variant. You're used to hearing it saying that in the year the king Uzziah died, I saw the Lord lofty lifted up sitting on his, uh, and, and his, the, the train of his robe was filling the temple. You know what it says in the Greek Septuagint? His glory is filling the temple. So in the Greek Septuagint, the very translation that the readers of the Gospel of John would first have access to, I, Isaiah says, I saw the glory of God in the temple in Isaiah 6.1. Everyone reading John 12.41 knew exactly what he was talking about. And it means that Jesus was identified as Yahweh. That is why he can be the one who reveals. He's the monogamous theos. He reveals the Father perfectly in John 1.18. You see, what he keeps forgetting is, no one has seen God except the monogamous theos, the eternal Logos who was as to his nature deity, entered into flesh. The one who's not been seen is the Father, not the Son. The reason that we can know the Father and that we can know His love and that we can know His perfection is because there is one who perfectly represented Him who is described in Hebrews chapter 1 as the exact representation of His being. That's what the Son is. That's the teaching of the New Testament when we allow it to speak for itself. Now what we heard were repeated references given to us concerning Unitarianism. You can go ahead and take the the computer down it makes it a little bit easier for us. We heard repeated references. Well, this is the one true God. This is the one true God. And, and why would that be relevant this evening unless you're simply assuming Unitarianism? I believe there's one true God. Well, there's a difference between the Father and the Son. I believe that too. You see, I just believe sola scriptura and tota scriptura. All of scripture. And so when Jesus is identified as God... In 2 Peter 1.1, 1, 1, then I believe 2 Peter 1.1. 1, 1. And when the Apostle Paul writes to Titus and says, we're, we're looking for the appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, I believe that. And when the Apostle Paul writes to the church of Philippi and quotes Isaiah 45.23, which is where Yahweh himself says that every knee will bow to him, every tongue will confess to him, and applies it to Jesus, I believe that too. What did I say at the beginning? You, you are the judges in this. There's no judges sitting up there. You all here are not going to be rendering any type of verdict at the end or anything like that. You are the judges in this debate. And therefore, you have to hold each one of us to a consistent standard of how we handle the text and how we represent the other side. You have to be the judges of it. And what we've heard so far this evening has been no interaction whatsoever with the simple reality that the New Testament writers speak of Jesus in a way that is absolutely, positively impossible of a mere creature. When they, when they, even, when, even when Paul describes the Son as the prototokos, the firstborn in Colossians 1.15, I hope you don't think that means first created. That would destroy Paul's entire argument in that text. He's arguing against the proto-Gnostics. The proto-Gnostics made Jesus a, a lower, one of the eons. 
If you interpret Colossians chapter 1, that Jesus is not the one who creates all things, then you are agreeing with the people Paul was arguing against and don't even know it, aren't even aware of it. It's amazing. When we look at the entirety of what the text of Scripture is saying, it is absolutely crystal clear. And I have not heard any meaningful rebuttal of, for example, 1 Peter 3.15. Why would the Apostle Peter identify Jesus as Yahweh in just simply talking to Christian people and saying, set Christ as kudios, Yahweh, in the Old Testament. It was not, by the way, he said it as a translation. It's not a translation. It's a transliteration. It's not, actually, it's a transmission. They didn't want to use the divine name in that fashion. And so they used kudios. And so we are to treat the Messiah as kudios, Yahweh, in our hearts. How in the world can any true follower of God treat anyone but God in that way in their hearts? We had a quote from a liberal Roman Catholic scholar. Great. That the, that the Trinity didn't develop until the 3rd or 4th century. I gave you Ignatius from 108 AD. Describing Jesus Christ as God and man. Which one's more important to you? I can give you a whole lot more. Ignatius described Jesus Christ as God ten times in his genuine epistles. In very strong, strong language. And by the way, I didn't expect this this evening. Because this is what I get from my, my Muslim friends all the time. But while Jesus was dead, was your trinity incomplete? I don't know what you all believe about death. Maybe you believe death is a cessation of existence. Christians don't believe that. So the Son, who has eternally existed as God, takes on a perfect human nature. And as the God-man gives that perfect life as the substitute for sin, he does not cease to exist. He said to the thief on the cross, what? I'm going to disappear today? No, he said, what? You will be with me in paradise. Today, you will be with me in paradise. Doesn't sound like he's planning on ceasing to exist, does it? Was the Trinity incomplete? No, the Trinity was not incomplete. And then, I, 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 I'll try to avoid using the term misrepresentation here. Hadn't brought it up. But I've been asked by Muslims many, many, many times, well, why would the Son say that, that the knowledge of the day and the hour is only in the Father's possession? The Son does not know. Notice how the Son is differentiated from men and angels and placed above them in Jesus' words. No Muslims believe that. But secondly, what I said was, in the incarnation, Jesus made himself of no reputation. Jesus didn't glow when he walked down the streets of Jerusalem at night. He and the disciples still had to use torches. And yet on the Mount of Transfiguration, what happened? What happened on the Mount of Transfiguration? Jesus shined with a, the, the brightest light possible. Well, do you think that was unusual for him? Or do you think that that was the one point in time when the veiling, and, and the idea of that veiling was mocked. Hmm, seems like his glory was veiled until that moment on the Mount of Transfiguration and then was veiled again as they came down off the mountain, wasn't it? So there were things about Jesus' pre-existent glory and power that he laid aside and veiled for the purpose of being the Messiah and being the one who gives his life as a ransom for sinners. And you and I had better be thankful for that because that's the only hope we have. That's the only hope we have. When we allow the scriptures to speak for themselves, we hear, for example, Psalm 110, the most often cited passage from the Old Testament in the New Testament. Did you know that? The Lord said to my Lord, sit in my right hand till I make your enemies footstool for your feet. Yahweh said to my, what? Lord. Now, that is the Father speaking to the Son. Oh, so the Father is Yahweh. Yes. Remember, I said that in my opening the vast majority of what we heard were arguments against positions I don't even hold. I don't even hold them. And my book says it clearly and plainly. So there's no reason to misrepresent. But see, I can believe Psalm 110. I stood up here in front of you before anything else was said and said, the, the Bible identifies the Father as Yahweh. Psalm 110.1 does so. Isaiah 53 does so. There's no question. But what happened? He did exactly what I told you he'd do. He assumed Unitarianism. So if the Father is Yahweh, 
That means only the Father is Yahweh because we're Unitarians. But what happens, my friends, what happens when the Bible says more than that? When the Bible identifies the Son as Yahweh? When John can easily say these things Isaiah said because he saw his glory, he spoke about him. Doesn't have to stop and explain himself. It's very clear, very easy. Because it fits with everything else. He's identified Jesus as the I am. That's who Yahweh is. He said that the, the, the Logos is as to his nature deity in John 1.1c. 1, 1, He's described him as Theos. So he doesn't have to stop and explain it. Because, folks, the doctrine of the Trinity is revealed between the Old and New Testament. Did you know that? It's revealed between them. You say, how, how can that be? Because remember, when's the New Testament written? It's written after the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, right? And what's the evidence of the doctrine of the Trinity? The incarnation of the Son, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Peter was an experiential Trinitarian. He had walked with the Son. He had heard the Father speak in the Mount of Transfiguration. He was now indwelt by the Holy Spirit. He was an experiential Trinitarian. All Christians are, in that sense. Because what did, what did Jesus say about the coming of the Spirit? That he and the Father would make their abode within us. How? By the Holy Spirit of God. The point is that the evidence of the revelation of the Trinity is the incarnation of Jesus Christ, his death, burial, resurrection, and then the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. The New Testament simply becomes the record of the result of that. And that's why that record can so easily. In 1 Corinthians chapter 8, for example, Paul can take the Shema. Remember Shema Yisrael, Yahweh Eloheinu, Yahweh Echad. Hear, O Israel, Yahweh is our God, Yahweh is one. It was what united all the Jewish people together. What does Paul do in 1 Corinthians chapter 8? Ever notice verses 4 and following? He takes the Shema and he expands it. How can you do that, Paul? Because God has done something and he's done something amazing. The incarnation, the Logos has become flesh. And so he talks about God the Father and he talks about one Lord Jesus Christ using the exact words from the Greek Septuagint translation of the Shema in Deuteronomy 6.4. And that's what Christians believe. You'd have to have something pretty amazing to be able to change the very prayer that defined the people of God. And it wasn't something Paul did. It was something Paul's reflecting on. It's called the fact that God had prophesied it back in Isaiah chapter 9. Yeah, there was that one who was going to become who was El Gabor, mighty God, which, by the way, is used in Isaiah 10, 21 of Yahweh. But that mighty God was going to come. He's going to be Prince of Peace. And that takes me to my final conclusions here in this section. Prince of Peace. I have peace with God this evening. Not because of who I am. I am absolutely unworthy of any of God's grace. Why do I have peace with God? Why can I wake up tomorrow morning not fearing the wrath of God? Because I know the Prince of Peace. The one described there in Isaiah 9. The Prince of Peace. Sar Shalom. Shalom. True peace with God. Not a ceasefire. True peace with God. When you know who Jesus really is, then you can understand why his sacrifice is so perfect in your place. A non-divine Jesus cannot be the one who brings about the full satisfaction of the wrath of God against our sins. And I can have true peace with God. Because I have a divine Savior. And that's why the Apostle Paul can say in Romans 5.1, Therefore, having been justified by faith, not by church membership, not by signing cards, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. True peace. Because he's the Prince of Peace. Why is this topic so important this evening? Why should we be passionate about it? There's some scary stuff going on in the world tonight. Do you know that? I don't know about you, but North Korea gives me the creeps. And here we are, hundreds of us, in this room talking about theology and Greek manuscripts. Yeah, you know why? Because the only message that's going to change this world, the only message that can change the hearts of stone of ISIS fighters 
the only message that can change the hearts of stone of the North Koreans who are torturing Christian believers even right now. The only message you can give hope for the next generations is not a message of a non-divine Savior. It's of a Savior who truly was divine and truly accomplished perfect peace in His self-giving. Because Paul warned us. He said to the Corinthians, I'm afraid that someone may come to you and preach a Jesus, a, a different Jesus that you've never received. I, I think you might put up with him. He warned us. Don't accept a false Jesus. Sola Scriptura, Scripture only. Tota Scriptura, all of Scripture. Believe it all, not just parts, not just a few things. When you believe them both, you'll understand why Christians, from the very beginning, have joined with Thomas, my Lord and my God. Thank you very much for your attention. And now we have the second cross-examination of the affirmative side by the negative side for 10 minutes. Uh, Dr. White, if I'm not mistaken, you said that Jesus did not cease to exist even though he's dead. Am I right? Yes, of course. Okay, all right. So, even though he's dead, he did not cease to exist. My question is, where was he when he was dead? Well, what did he say to the thief on the cross? He said, today you will be with me in paradise. So he was in paradise? Can I finish my answer, please? Okay. Because the Bible says more than just that, all right? Okay. He says, today you will be with me in paradise. So there's a place called paradise. We are also told elsewhere, and we're not sure exactly when during this time period, but Jesus went and made proclamation to the spirits who were in prison who were rebellious in the days of Noah. So there was some declaration of his victory over death that took place during that time period as well. Okay, so you're not sure where was he when he was dead for the I three days? I just gave you a very clear answer. Okay. I don't know why you are right. not See, sure. So when you're dead, you're not really dead, in other words. No, death okay. is not non-existent, sir. Okay. So when Christ said, I will be, you will be with me in paradise, was Christ already in paradise at that time? Of course not. It's in the future. Okay, so it's in the future. Yes, it is. Does he say that after my death I will be there in paradise? He says, today you will be with no, me I'm, in paradise. My question is, when he said, I well, will I be with you, what Jesus said, so I, I will be with you in question. paradise, did he say, after the th or when I'm dead, I will be in paradise with you? Did he say that? When you're hanging on a cross, you generally are very brief in your statement. Okay, now so. uh, I'll change my question. So, so That's you a good idea. You know, okay, here's, here's my question again. Okay. Um, we, we go back to Matthew 24, 36. Yes, I believe since that's, that's one of the verses you have a hard time answering. Okay. So when Jesus said that he does not know the day and the hour of his coming, is that right or wrong? <laughs> oh, yeah, that's obviously, a good obviously, I believe everything that the Word of God says. Now, you probably <laughs> should go to Mark for this rather Mark than 13, Matthew, to be perfectly honest with you. Mark 13, 32? You should go to Mark 13, 32. Yes, yeah, so the same thing a, anyway. There is a textual variant in this, Matthew 24. Okay. But, so, but uh, yes. Okay. Uh, My I, question I is, Mark 13, 32, so. when he said he does not know the day yes. and the hour of yes. his coming, mm -hmm. is he telling us the truth? Obviously, yes, sir. So he does not know. I don't even know why you would ask me that question. Well, because the Bible says, 1 John 3, 20, that God knows all things. Yes. Okay. It also says if he's God not knows, a man. The, right? If God knows all things, how would you classify Jesus as God when God, when the Bible says God knows all things? Because I believe the rest of what the Bible says. Now stop. You right. asked me a question. I'm now going to answer it. That's the only one. I'm going to answer your question. Go ahead and make because my Because I don't accept just a part of the Bible. I accept the fact that the very same Bible and the very same author of 1 John 3 says that the Word became flesh. I accept all of it. You only accept part of it. That's how I answer your question. Okay, now, so, when he said that he does not know that he and uh, an hour of his coming, that would, would that make him omniscient or knows all things? It, no more than his glory was in full display or anything else. There was a limiting 
of oh, the second okay. person in the incarnation. So that, he made himself nothing, sir. So uh, when he was limited, as I will follow what you're arguing is, when he, when he was limited here on earth, so he was not really telling the truth. Correct? What? Was he telling the truth that he does not know the day and hour of his coming? Yes. He knows? Because he used the present tense. Okay. He does not know that. Does not now or did not then? I'm asking you, in Mark 13, 32, he said, Oh, that day and that hour, right. no one knows. Okay? Is he just pretending that he knows, but he does not know? Oh, okay. The incarnation is real, sir. Yes, I know. I know what you're talking about. Unfortunately, that answer does not answer my question. Does he know or he does not know? I've already answered this question. You're, you're begging the question. I've, I've told you the answer. Everybody in this room knows what the answer is. As the incarnate one, certain aspects of Jesus' knowledge were veiled. You reject the incarnation, and okay. therefore you say, I'm not answering your question. I just believe all the Bible. I'm sorry. Okay. I cannot reject okay. any portion all of the right. scripture. Let's go back to John 1 1. You said that the os, that the os in the third clause. John 1 1. Of course. Yes. You know that for real? I John 1 1. I would, I would like to. Keep the os in all of us. Mm -hmm. Okay. Say. You have the word theos there in John 1 1. See? Okay. You said that Jesus is the God in John 1 1. See, correct? Right? If you read my book, sir, I have a rather extensive discussion of the fact that theos. I am is... asking you a simple question. No, you're not, Don't sir. Don't tell no, me to go no, back you to your not, book. Sir. No, you're not, sir. Please answer my question. Sir, I am a scholar of this language. I will answer it truthfully, and I will not allow you to force me to answer it falsely. I know that you're a scholar, okay? Okay. And I'm, so, I'm very happy. What I said in my book, sir, if you will be truthful with me for just a moment, please be fair here. You want these people to understand John 1 1 C, or you just want to make Don't ask me, I'm the one asking you. Okay. okay. John, uh, what I said in my book was that the position of the word theos describes the nature of the logos. That's where I'm as going, deity. sir. Deity. Okay. That's Mr. What I said Greek in the book. scholar, I'm going there on the theos, which you said is a nature. Okay. The Jesus nature in John 1 1 C is God. Am I right? The nature of the, the Logos. Nature, the nature of the Logos. Because the Logos hadn't become okay. flesh yet, sir. Now, now in John 1, 1 b you have another word that means God. Right? After it's, a preposition. Okay, yeah. after the preposition. Right. E, okay. All right. Prostantio. Now, is that one God in John 1, 1 b the same as the God in John 1, 1 c Or different? How, how could you even ask the question if you can no, read the language? No, my question. Because pro, I, I will. Okay. Cross tom theon, cross means in the presence of, so you have a distinction in the language, whereas the position of theos, there is no preposition here, and therefore it's describing the nature I of the I will logos. repeat my question, sir. Okay? I, I'm sorry if you can't understand the answer, sir. Oh, thank you. It seems that your question, okay, your answer is very vague. Let's go back. Okay, no, it's slowly, very specific, actually. slowly, slowly. Okay, you said John one one C. There is a God. The nature of Jesus is as being God. I said his nature is deity. Okay, like deity or God. Okay, now in John one one B, you have another God. No, I do not. There's only one God, sir. I'm a monotheist. No, so no. John. In, in John one one B. You mean in, you have Tan Theon. Tan Theon. The father. There's God. Okay, right, there's the, the father. God. Or the Pros God. Tan Theon. Pros Tan Theon. The Logos was in the presence of the Father okay, for eternity. All right. Yes. Pros Tan Theon. Mm -hmm. Is the Pros Tan Theon the same as the Theos in the third clause? Of course not. Not. Okay, good. That's what I'm looking for. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Can I change my question now? Now. Okay, uh, that's what I've been looking for. You've been looking for this? this <laughs> well, I'll, I'll uh, go ahead, go ahead. Hey, to you, yes. <laughs> cheer, cheer. <laughs> I have some more good questions for you, Br Dr. White. Brief pause, Mr. Yes, Sorry okay. about that. All right. Because you were, you were trying to accuse us of that we consider Christ as a mere creature. Now, in Philippians 2.9, which of course you use in your book, okay, my question there is based on verse 9. Okay, for God has highly exalted him. 
Can you tell us the meaning of the word exalted? To, well, wait a minute. Uh, to, to, it's used in the Greek Septuagint of exaltation of someone to a high place of honor. Very nice. A very nice question. Mm -hmm. So, Jesus was exalted. Am I right? Yes, by the Father. By the Father. Mm -hmm. Does it say there in Philippians to mind the Father or says God? Well, given the entire oh, context, okay. given okay. the entire context, yes, so, it's very so there's a God. Did there's you want a... an answer to that, or are you just okay, move, moving along? Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> okay. So here in Philippians two nine, there is a God who exalted Jesus Christ. Am I correct? Yes. Okay. So here you have one God who exalts another. Am I right? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> I thought, I thought it's one God exalting another no, because, God. because you, you're starting in the middle. Okay. We, and we can all see why you're starting in the middle. If no. you would start at the beginning of the hymn, you would be able to answer all your own questions. I know, I know Philippians 2, 6, 7. That's why my question is based on Philippians 2, 9. All right? Oh, I can understand that. Uh, you understand it. Okay? Yeah, sure. I mean, when it says he was equal with the Father. You're a Greek scholar. You know, you know what you're talking about. So, okay. Let's, let's go back to that verse 9. It says here, God exalted Jesus Christ. Okay? If Jesus Christ is God, okay, or the eternal Son of God, is there a need for exaltation? You, you, uh, yes, because of Dion. Because of what? Dion. Since you, since you don't want to read the whole thing, I'll just read it. because of Dion. It's my it's my time to actually time's up. Right. Dion. Thank you very much. Now, when you. Till I get up, time is barely out.